This week, special Security Weekly co-host, Mr. Keith Hoodlett, uh, the uh, primary host for Application Security Weekly, will be joining me this week uh, in place of John Strand, who is traveling um, <clears throat> excuse me, this week and next. So Keith and I will talk about um, a book review, actually. I just finished The Phoenix Project. Uh, in preparation, we're trying to get Gene on a number of our different programs. He's just releasing Beyond the Phoenix Project. I thought it was a good time for Keith and I both to talk about uh, some of the high-level lessons that you can learn from that book and apply immediately to your jobs in enterprise security today. Uh, so make sure you stay tuned for that. It's going to be awesome. I'm so excited. Um, in the news... I thought it was nice. Cisco has made a, a very good uh, donation and a charitable fund that they're setting up uh, to combat homelessness. So we'll talk about that. I thought they deserve to be in the news for that. Uh, the rest of it is all technology related. Uh, Google's losing um, a battle to Oracle. Uh, Alex Stamos is stepping down from Facebook uh, and all kinds of other enterprise security news. All that and more on this edition of Enterprise Security Weekly. This is Security Weekly, for security professionals, by security professionals. Broadcasting live from G-Unit Studios in Rhode Island, it's the show where we talk security vendors and aren't afraid to name names. It's Enterprise Security Weekly. Was, uh, the teleprompter now has artificial intelligence, Doug, and updates itself. It's awesome. <laughs> uh -huh. Uh, this week and talk about them as it relates to enterprise security. You're going to do great. <laughs> we're gonna, we're gonna... I, I think that people think that you and I talk like every day at night. You know, yeah. it's like, hey, what are you doing? It's kind of a bit of an exhausting week. And I think that we noticed that a little bit in the uh, stories for this week as well. Stop attackers from domain credential theft and lateral movement with a 99% success rate by using artificial intelligence to control the attacker's perception of the environment. Javelin Networks is the world's first endpoint intrusion containment platform to protect domain networks. Javelin detects targeted attacks and breaches by obfuscating Active Directory, domain controllers, domain identities, domain credentials, and all domain resources. It only takes one compromised machine to jeopardize the entire organization. Don't be a victim. Visit javelin-networks.com and request a demo of AD Protect today. Are you worried about PCI compliance? Does your development team understand or care about security? Are you ready to face a breach of your customer's sensitive data? See the worst that can happen before it does. Black Hills Information Security can help you help management see the future. Email consulting at blackhillsinfosec.com to find out how a web application penetration test can mitigate the risk before you go live. Minerva Lab stops malware that traditional antivirus solutions cannot block. Minerva works with your existing anti-malware tools to stop evasive threats by deceiving them into a dormant state, dramatically increasing your rate of prevention. Minerva's solution does not require ongoing care and feeding and will not get in the way of business users. With Minerva, adversaries have to pick their poison, implement evasive tactics and get caught by Minerva, or don't employ evasion and get stopped by AV. To learn more and request a demo, visit minerva-labs.com today. Welcome, everyone, to episode 85 of Enterprise Security Weekly. It is Wednesday, March 28th, 2018. I'm your host, Paul Asadorian. Very, very excited to be joined by none other than Keith Hoodlett, who has some title that I can't remember at Bug Crowd. <laughs> You just got a and security engineer. Trust I, and security I, and, engineer. You know, I build trust and security. <laughs> and now, uh, it was just public, Keith, that uh, Netflix is now a proud uh, customer. Is that is that they true? are okay? Yeah, and, and quite frankly, it's uh, it's cool because I mean, we work with a number of companies, right? It's not just uh, just your Netflixes of the world. We mm -hmm. work with Mastercard, Tesla, Netgear. Uh, yeah, ton of companies. Yeah, I thought it was uh, it was interesting. Someone in the industry news is that Foxconn, who's the chip manufacturer uh, for Apple, uh, based out of I believe it's is it Taiwan? I think they're a Taiwanese company. That sounds about right. Yeah. And so they just purchased Belkin, which comes along with it. Linksys, which comes along with it. Wemo. I know that they've had bug bounty programs in the past. To be honest with you, Keith, I'm not sure exactly who they're with, or and they seemed very limited uh, in scope. Um, but I'm, I'm curious now with this, they called it more of a merger, uh, than an acquisition. Uh, and I forget the amounts we covered it on, uh, hack naked news yesterday, but I'm cute. I speculated yesterday on the show, like, what does this mean for security? I would love it if Foxconn, the parent company would say, 
you know what, we're just going to go ahead and formalize a bug bounty program with bug crowd for all three of these uh, properties that we have now uh, and, and kind of open up the scope. Cause I think for, especially in consumer embedded IOT, that that's a, a huge win uh, all around and shows a commitment to security that we can only hope be applied to these products that are on the market today. For sure. I mean, to the extent that IOT is probably the hottest market right now from a bug bounty perspective as well, because let's face it, you're seeing all sorts of devices find their way into the home, into the business uh, that a lot of people don't even know. Hey, I procured that TV, but that TV is an internet connected device that happens to be running Android and is super vulnerable. Uh, And most companies don't realize that that is a foothold into their network. I always am reminded of whenever you go to RSA and you see those uh, bus printed things that say, is your printer secure from, uh, you know, vulnerabilities? That's the foothold into your network. And I'm like, printers? And then I'm like, oh, yeah, wait, those things are probably not just printers anymore. <laughs> yeah, we ran a technical segment last year on uh, hacking printers uh, that I thought was a lot of fun. Um, <clears throat> make sure that you check out our fine friends at itpro.tv, itpro.tv forward slash security weekly. They're a proud sponsor here in the network because, well, we use them and, and you should too. Um My most recent project is really going to be centered around Docker. And I'm starting to, uh, I have a whole bunch of content for an upcoming presentation based largely on my work with our own internal application, which we'll talk about in our second segment today. uh, And maybe even tease people to some changes that we've we've made there. But I'm starting to research some of the tools for applying not just security to Docker, but Docker and other platforms uh, in the DevOps uh, environment. And my first kind of module that I'm working on is scanning all of your images. And it appears now, and, and I didn't know this, uh, there were so many projects, and some of them are newer, uh, that projects exist to do this that are open source. There's a lot of commercial tools that do it. And scanning your containers is obviously just one thing as part of your security uh, platform. I was speaking with uh, one of our newer sponsors, CyberArk, yesterday, uh, and they were saying that one of the things that they're hearing is that DevOps uh, developers are suffering from tool fatigue, right? Because you've got Docker and then Kubernetes and then you've got Jenkins and then you've got Git and then now you've got these other tools that are applying security. And so we've kind of got this tool fatigue because there's so many tools to implement uh, this process. So uh, that's kind of what I'm looking at now. I always go back to IT Pro TV and familiarize myself with the technology whether it's DevOps, whether it's Docker, whatever modules they have, it's a great way as you embark on a newer project or building upon an existing project to go get some training on that topic, which is why I talked about some of my my recent work um, as I was kind of transitioning from my last presentation, which was all about network monitoring and enterprise security using open source tools. I focused largely on the Security Onion, which I love. Probably one of the best uh, tool and suite of tools out there for uh, in open source for enterprise security uh, on the monitoring, network monitoring especially. Uh, so I'll be kind of doing it in the background, but my focus now is on, on these Docker tools. And you know, in both cases, IT Pro TV has great materials to help you with your projects. So uh, that's a resounding endorsement for our fine friends at IT Pro TV who are at InfoSec World. I'm looking forward to seeing their content that they created at, at InfoSec World. I apologize. I wish I could have spent more time with our friends at IT Pro TV, but I was... Uh, my role was interviewing all of the vendors uh, that were there and that took up most of my time. So, And we talked about that on Paul Security Weekly and Business Security Weekly. We haven't really talked about Enterprise Security Weekly and I'm assuming it'll come up as we talk about some of these companies that some of them I did uh, more of a briefing with, some of them just you know generally familiarizing myself with what they do. So it was good. Keith, you were out at InfoSec World. What was your impression of the, the show floor? It was impressive, uh, quite frankly. I mean, it was one of those things where I went to it and not having ever been to InfoSec World before, not really knowing what I was going to be getting myself into, which is always a good thing whenever I'm adventuring with the Security Weekly team. And of course, they're speaking uh, for my own talk as well. And it was kind of like, I I felt a little bit like I was at Black Hat before Black Hat got huge, is Mm -hmm. kind of the way that I would say. You had really, you know, interesting companies that were doing good work. I know that uh, I think we were positioned right next to Wombat, which I think there's a story in the yeah. news here about them. Uh, IT Pro TV was there, which is also really cool to see them. And, and of course, a number of other companies were there as well. And I can see it being the sort of thing that has just enough of a business appeal. And uh, at the same time, really great technical talks and really great uh, people in the audience that are also technical practitioners, that the mix was just right to be something like a black hat. 
uh, in terms of when it was smaller and a little bit more intimate. So if you're looking for a conference next year to go to in the Southeast, uh, especially because it's at Disney World, so it gives you an excuse to hopefully bring your family and let them go enjoy the parks, uh, it's an opportunity to go and, and be part of a conversation that you'll meet some really great speakers that you only see at a Black Hat or a DEF CON or a Derby CON, but you'll get to actually talk to them, mm -hmm. uh, which is really cool. Yeah, no, I agree. Uh, so let's see, let's uh, jump right into the enterprise security news now. Um, I saw the story, I, I thought it was a, a good lead in on a positive note. Uh, Cisco has committed $50 million to end homelessness in Silicon Valley. I thought that was pretty cool. I think we should recognize them for, uh, you know, making a pledge for a, and especially such a large uh, financial donation to uh, a worthy cause uh, in the area as Many of us, myself included, and I'm not sure if you've ever been to RSA, Keith, but you can certainly uh, see some of the homelessness problem when you attend to RSA. So I especially was, you know, kind of in tune with that, having witnessed it firsthand, and many of us have uh, at RSA. So I thought it was a great thing that Cisco's doing here. For sure. I mean, it's one of those interesting things that I, people always tell you, don't walk past 6th Street. So it's like right by the Moscone Center, two blocks down. And that's because of the rampant homelessness that they have yeah. in San Francisco, which is really, it's so sad because it's such a, a rich culture from not only um, just the kind of the diversity, but also from all of the technical scene that's in San Francisco and how much venture capital is being poured into the city. Uh, and it makes me wonder as well. So this is obviously a, an amazing pledge uh, on part of Cisco, but the cost of housing there for those that even have an income is just incredible. Yes. Uh, people are renting, you know, couches for a thousand dollars a month and it's a couch. Like it's not even a full apartment. Um, yeah, I'm, I look forward to seeing that something be done about this. I hope that part of the efforts uh, that Cisco and other companies will put in will be working with the uh, municipality, right? To mm -hmm. figure out how to do this effectively uh, in a way that doesn't cause housing costs for everyone to explode and to make this uh, 50 million kind of disappear because, you know, today if you had 50 million, you might be able to buy a house, like just one. Yeah. Uh, as you mentioned, Wombat Security was in the news and they were recently acquired by Proofpoint and yeah. they are very much a security awareness and training company. Uh, it was, I, I don't remember, and I, I probably have notes on this. Uh, I know the team that from Wombat that was uh, next to us at InfoSec World. Uh, usually, uh, and I don't want to say usually, I don't actually know the numbers, but my general sense is it's the local sales team, the local account team uh, that comes yeah. to a number of these shows. The larger so shows like RSA and Black Hat may be the local team in addition to a, a much larger team. Um, it's kind of all over the map who attends some of these shows. But Wombat was there. The team was very nice. Uh, I, can, I can't say that. And I can't say that about every single vendor that was on the floor. Some, a, a lot of people I did not have that warm and fuzzy experience with. It was one of our cautions. Like, you got to make sure you coach your people in the booth. Like, there's not just right. customers there. There's other people there, too, that could help you or just want to learn about what you do. So you got to be nice. The Wombat team was, was, was great. Um, I'm not sure what their major differentiator is. I know they just had an announcement that said they've got some materials that are available in their program to combat insider threat, which I thought was interesting to kind of let your employees know about maybe how to spot insider threat. And I think that's a good additional countermeasure to some other things you might do uh, in the vein of detecting insider threats uh, and, and insider uh, you know, breaches, essentially, and exfiltration of data. Uh, and certainly training your employees to spot it much in the same way as they would spot an external threat. They can also be trained to spot an internal threat. So I don't think it's a bad, a bad strategy. Again, I'm not sure what Wombat's differentiator is. I probably have notes on it, but I, I can't remember off the top of my head, which is kind of an issue in our industry today. I typically give the vendor like one, like what's your one thing? Like give me one thing right. that really sets you apart. What's your one thing that you really do well, that you focus on, that you're selling on today? And uh, I don't remember what that was for Wombat. I'm sure they do have one thing. Uh, I think Wombat's major focus is is working to prevent phishing attacks and malware infections. It's kind of like their thing, right? Like they yeah, really want to everyone, enable... Everyone does that, though. Everyone claims they do that. 
Right, right. Like everyone, everyone says they do. I unfortunately I've never used Wombat's product, so I don't know firsthand how effective it is. But to, it, it's interesting as well. I'd be curious to see how they're classifying insider threat, right? Because there's, in my mind, there's two kinds of insider threat. There's insider threat that's your Edward Snowden's, the active insider that is working at your organization to subvert your organization in some way. Um, whether that's you know someone that was a plant hire by another company and has has been bought, or someone that has been bribed in some way, right? Then there's also kind of the unwitting insider threat. So that's the person that opens the phishing email, clicks on the link, and infects themselves with malware, and off to the races the bad guys go. I don't know if, in my mind, like, it is one way to classify an insider threat, but I almost count that like an external third party. I know that um, with what you folks do at Offensive Countermeasures, I imagine you probably have some thoughts on that, Paul. Yeah. Um, I think that, you know, we classify behavior as either bad or good and not necessarily on the surface track it back to an insider uh, type of threat, but certainly it is feasible that you could detect some type of insider threat uh, using your network security monitoring tools by looking at what might be abnormal in your traffic. And I mean, that's a whole art and science in and of itself is we always say you should detect what's normal and then detect the variances from that. But there's, I mean, there's so many different aspects of that. Uh, probably make for a good separate uh, segment. But certainly, you can get those early indicators, and then once you dig deeper, determine if it was an insider threat or not. Uh, I, I do have to say, after talking to a number of email phishing protection companies, as well as security awareness and training companies, that there needs to be obviously a blend. If, you were to, if you're protecting an enterprise today, and let's say you hired me to protect your enterprise today, I think it's a pretty valid strategy to have uh, a tightly coupled security awareness and training aspect along with active email phishing protections that tie together and are integrated and continually evolving. Uh, I think it's table stakes today if you're doing any kind of email phishing protection, for example, to have your users identify what to them looks like a phishing attack. Their awareness and training is going to help them with that identification. Click a button and go, I think this is phishing. Have that feed into what was going to be one of our topics today, security orchestration and automation and, uh, and response. And then uh, there's a, maybe a human in the loop and that email gets pulled from everyone's inbox. And that seems to be table stakes today, which isn't necessarily where we were five or 10 years ago. Um, but I think it's a, a great thing. But I think there has to be that tight coupling. There is some partnering between some of these companies. I think Fish Me leans more towards that awareness and training, but also has an automated solution, but also integrates... Uh, and they all, some partner for various reasons, like, you know, blacklists and uh, behavior lists and things like that. So I would definitely choose the best. In, I don't know who the best in breed is uh, in these. I know I spoke with No before, not really about their products uh, so much, uh, but they're experiencing some fantastic growth um, from what I'm told, which, and they haven't gotten acquired. So you, you can use that as kind of an indicator, right? Maybe in the acquisition by Proofpoint is a good thing for Wombat. I'm not saying it's a negative, but no before is growing very well on their own. And that's a sign that they're solving problems for people, uh, which is important. I haven't, again, used any of these products. Uh, and then, you know, there's the the Great Horns, the Mimecast, the Fish Labs, uh, and it's just a whole string of companies that are also doing this as well. And it'd be interesting there's, to see who people like in this space and how it how it evolves. There's um, one who I believe they're actually a partner on the network at this point is uh, Rapid7. They actually have it in beta right now. Mm -hmm. um, and they've announced it publicly, I think, at Black Hat last year, their Insight Fish product or tool, mm -hmm. which is almost to do exactly what you're talking about, Paul. Sure. And Log so, Logarithm has uh, an open source and it integrates with their commercial product to do the very same thing as well. So you, you're, it's a good point, Keith. You are seeing it as features from some of the larger companies that say, hey, we can we can do this too. And a lot of times they can also integrate if you have one of these other uh, providers as well. So it, it's a pretty pretty interesting space that's uh, evolving and we'll certainly cover more uh, on the network as, as time goes on and we catch up with more of these vendors. I want to talk yeah, about um, Facebook and really as it relates to Alex Stamos. Now, I, I don't personally know Alex. I know that very well, uh, Alex has been in the community for a long time. Very well, our paths could have crossed uh, our paths have crossed like between mutual friends for sure. Uh, I think from the surface and just reading the articles and not having spoken to to Alex or anyone official um, that, you know, he was at Yahoo. I think he kind of saw some writing on the wall at Yahoo, 
left and then was at Facebook right after Yahoo? Is that true? Yeah, or I believe he um was there a stop the, in between the joining there was a there was a brief break in there, I think. Mm -hmm. I think there was maybe like a couple of months where he he was not uh at Facebook officially, but I think that when he left Yahoo, he was very quickly scooped up by Facebook, is my understanding. Alex was very vocal about being more transparent about what was happening with some of the things with Facebook ads and influencing elections. Given the all the stuff that's come out lately at Facebook, Alex was probably like, yes, we need to be more transparent. The What has been written and what I've gathered from it is that he got some pushback at Facebook and is, is leaving. I'm not sure how, how much he was pushed out or how much of the decision was uh, of his own accord. Um, what I did read was that he will stay on through August, uh, which kind of makes me think that he was like, yes, I'm leaving. And they were like, no, please stay and help us with the transition. Um, but certainly there's some frustrations there. If you've read any of the news about Facebook recently, you can understand, yeah, you can disaster. potentially understand like some of his frustrations. My, my concern is that now we, we leave these big companies like Yahoo and Facebook now without someone like an Alex Stamos that has that experience and knowledge uh, in our industry and as part of our community and is no one there relaying that from our community into uh, some of those larger companies. I think YouTube has... Uh, a Google property, obviously very much of the same issues with some of their content uh, and lack of content restrictions that are happening in their YouTube uh, business. But I think that's the big story here and a lesson for everyone working in enterprise. Like what do you do when your security person who's been the champion for security and privacy and transparency in your organization is leaving? Um, and, and how do you replace that person? Uh, also, if you're looking to hire someone, Alex might be on your list of some of these companies uh, to hire because uh, if he hasn't already, you know, I'm sure he's uh, entertaining a lot of offers. But uh, if you need someone like that in your organization, you know, someone who's well respected in our community uh, will be out of Facebook in August. It's, it's interesting because people have been saying like Alex Stamos is effectively the ethics canary of the security community, right? Like right. when he left Yahoo, it, it was because speculating again, but people have stated uh, that it was because not um, like all the stuff that they were doing for the government. It's that they were putting these backdoors into systems without telling the security team about the fact that they were doing it. Right. Yes. And I imagine that he probably would have put the kibosh on that anyway, if he had known about it, which is maybe why they didn't tell him. Uh, so that that's kind of been the rumor mill about why he left Yahoo. And then his leaving Facebook, it sounds pretty accurate based on just from everything that has been publicly speculated about in terms of his state of ethics, where he had serious issues with, as you know, has come out in the news over the whole uh, Russia interference at the election speculations and things of that nature, um, that it sounded like he was pushing back very hard on, on ways in which they were doing things as a business. And to that end, the business said, no, we're not, we're not actually going to listen to you here. And in fact, cut his team down from something like 120 people to four or five mm. uh, is what the, the news has been reporting. So um, they've effectively said, yeah, we're going to hire you. They didn't like what they heard when he, they hired him and then they cut his, cut his team. And so he said, you know what? Yeah, I don't need to be here anymore. Yeah. Um, I, I respect Alex said, because he's taken on roles that are extremely challenging. And, and for that reason, right? he commands, you know, my respect um, because those are, those are very difficult. Obviously, Going into it, you may not think, well, Alex taking a job with Yahoo, like you don't really know how challenging that is until there's a bunch of fallout and then he leaves and you're like, wow, that was a really challenging position. It sounds like it was equally as challenging, maybe even more challenging at Facebook. Uh, so, you know, props to him for, for taking on some extremely challenging roles uh, in security. And uh, hopefully he lands, hopefully his next gig is, is turns out much better for him. <laughs> I hope for his right. sake, right? One could argue, I mean, he's worked at companies that have shaped the internet, right? Mm -hmm. Yahoo shaped the internet for many, many years. Um, early starts of the kind of the dot-com boom. Uh, and then now Facebook has definitely shaped the internet in a lot of different ways. And so, yeah, I, I wish him all the luck. I hope that he lands someplace that uh, matches with his ethics uh, and as well as will do, of, of course, great work with. Um, it's so it's in, this battle is interesting. It's been going on for a really long time between Google and Oracle. And yeah, this is a disaster. Looking disaster. At this, this is just a total disaster. The recent ruling is an, a disaster. And they, they've been going back and forth in the courts. There's been a numerous appeals. Um, and so you can just a little background knowledge in, in really very many cases, depending on the circumstances, um, you can keep appealing all the way up to the, the federal Supreme Court uh, if the law allows for that. There's, there are some cases where it depends on the case, like they'll stop you at a certain level. 
Um, but in this case, you know, they keep appealing and it keeps getting escalated to the uh, the next circuit and and so on and so forth. And the ruling seems to be flopping. So uh, essentially, Google used Java on the Android platform. And yeah, but Java is is open source. And now there's speculation that the latest ruling, which is in favor of Oracle, could spell disaster for some companies that are using open source technologies, allowing for the owners or owners in air quotes, right, of that open source technology to then sue those companies, which which is interesting. So now that the the, the uh, pendulum has swung in Oracle's favor and Google could be facing some pretty hefty fines, even for Google, those could be some pretty hefty uh, fines that they'll have to pay uh, to Oracle. And apparently Oracle's done this with another, or there was another case that was cited in the article. Yeah, I don't recall, and I'll have to look back at the article to determine what the other property was at Oracle that they they also happen to have this kind of battle over. I predict that this will probably be the death of enterprise Java if if this stands, right? Because they are basically saying Google violated copyright laws uh, using Oracle APIs to build uh, the Android platform, mm -hmm. which is built with Java. And so effectively what happened is it was back and forth started in 2010 In 2012, there was a ruling in 2016 kind of like back and forth in the appellate courts uh, ruled in Google's uh, favor. And now this sounds like uh, after a challenge, it has been upheld that in this case, Oracle actually does own the rights to uh, Java. And now it could be as much as $9 billion in damages is what Oracle is asking for, which, you know, 9 billion with a B is, astronomical for anybody yep. uh, even if it's google so to me if this stands right this sends a, a giant message to any organization that if you are building in java today stop and find something else because mm -hmm. uh they will eventually come out uh, out at you if if oracle is big enough and effectively java is now potentially for some companies an existential threat to develop in, which is crazy to say because it has been taught in universities mm -hmm. uh, the world over for a decade or more. And so, but this also then extends now the way you've analyzed it, Keith, to server-side Java, not just Java on the client. Yeah, yeah, that's my understanding is it's it's use of Oracle APIs under Java as a copyright. So yeah, it's not, it, it's everything that is, made with java it's not just android as a platform i mean can you imagine um gosh any of the server-side java that's done for building an application that you you sell right if you're software as a service and you have a, a java web app that's potentially mm. being you know caught up in this dragnet so this is this is kind of a wholesale i don't know uh, a black mark on java as a development uh language and eventually for the platform use of java uh, it, it also doesn't really ring very well for Android, for that matter, if you think about it that way, right? Uh, for Android, as uh, explosive as it is in terms of bad updates and things of that nature, which is an entirely separate set of problems. Um, I don't know if I'd be interested in developing on the Android platform knowing that Google may decide to say, you know what, screw it, we're going to use Go. We're going to develop our own platform at this point to replace Android and just mm -hmm. uh, you know, do away with Java entirely. Uh, you added a Kubernetes vulnerability in here, Keith. I want to hear more about that. Yeah, this one was actually really kind of scary because uh, it's a 2017 vulnerability, but I, I wanted to bring it up because Kubernetes is one of those tools, as we kind of mentioned Docker at the beginning, uh, where containerization is uh, growing and Kubernetes is kind of the new hot thing that people are adopting in place of, uh, uh, say, Docker. And so in this case, it was actually a CVSS score of three, or excuse me, CVSS score, uh, it didn't say three here, it, that CVSS version three, uh, but it didn't actually give the scoring, so my apologies there. It is a volume mount arbitrary file access problem. So Kubernetes 1.3 to 1.6, as well as some uh, 1.7, 1.8, and 1.9 versions had an issue where clusters uh, of Kubernetes uh, containers could allow untrusted users to control the spec content for the pods. Uh, as well as prevent host file system access via host path. And then also in addition to that, using subpath volume mounts, if the clusters were happen to be using those for say storing things on disk, uh, it could allow untrusted containers to actually access the file system, uh, which I thought was crazy because if you think about it, right, the idea or the, all of the concepts behind Kubernetes is, okay, let's uh, abstract away 
the entire uh, you know ecosystem have a minimalized container to run this application in. Uh, and therefore, I don't need to worry about the host that I'm running it on. I don't need to worry about uh, host level security. And this is exactly the kind of problem uh, that presents itself where if you're an Amazon, uh, Google, or you know what have you, right, and you're running Kubernetes clusters, and suddenly you've got people that can read the actual hosts file system, it's all bad in so many levels. Uh, so this is a patch is it, now um, kind of problem in my mind. Is it just the host file system, or is it other volumes that I've created inside of Docker? Like, is it both? It's my understanding of it. So in this case, the vulnerability impact is that a specially crafted pod spec combined with malicious container behavior can allow read or write access uh, to arbitrary files outside of the volume specified in the pod, which includes the file system. So right. So that's any uh, imagine, that's any Docker volumes or any local file systems. Right, I mean, they're treated right. so, they're treated the same but different in in your Docker configuration. But right. Essentially, it's trying to, like you said, abstract that layer even. Uh, net, so basically, network and file systems, right? You control in, I'm not exactly sure how Kubernetes works, but in Docker, uh, like a Docker Compose script, for example, you'd say this container has access to this other container and also has access to this other file system, which is could be a, a volume that just exists in Docker, not necessarily on the host. You can also configure on the host, right? Uh, and then you say, well, this other container, which is maybe your public-facing one, doesn't have access to that volume. That's just for these other two containers. You define those rules. It sounds to me like this vulnerability lets you bypass those rules when you're using Kubernetes. That's my read of it as well. And so the way that I would uh, call volumes in terms of like the way that they interact with your file system is um, kind of like virtualized uh, space yes. for yeah, for consumption. So it's instead of having a virtualized uh, system as a container or a virtual machine, you have a virtualized volume inside of your file system. Uh, so your file system doesn't actually read it as a separate volume. It, it lives on disk in the same way that your file system is set up. But Docker has effectively kind of tagged it as this is a virtual file system at this correct, point. Correct, correct. So, yeah, not good, uh, to say the least. Especially, I mean, admittedly, I would say that a lot of companies that are adopting this sort of technology are going to be the really big cloud providers, which is hopefully, you know, they probably patched by this point, but um, those companies that are starting to move to that whole DevOps process and are looking at Kubernetes need to start paying attention probably to some of these issue tickets, especially when they have CVEs associated with them. Um, so I just want to mention a couple more stories before we take a, a short break. Uh, Distill Networks has their bad bot report. I strongly recommend our, our listeners uh, check that out. Uh, Rami Saad was on uh, a previous episode, and we're doing a webcast that'll dig more into the details of that report. Uh, if you're doing any kind of application and or really enterprise security architecture, uh, especially in support of web applications, you definitely want to check out that report as identifying bad bots can make your lives, whether you're a developer or whether you're a systems administrator, network administrator, or security professional, make your lives a lot better, to be honest with you, is my, my glean on that. And if you think bad bots are just a problem that sites like Facebook and LinkedIn and YouTube have, you're mistaken. There's a lot of great benefit that enterprises can get uh, and a great study put together by uh, Distill Networks, uh, who's a sponsor of this network and uh, great people to work with and great technology. So uh, I really always appreciated what they've done. Uh, they actually came about on Enterprise Security Weekly when we were curious like what they did based on one of their press releases. Uh, and I got an opportunity to speak with Rami and uh, was really impressed. I'm like, oh, that's what you guys do. That's awesome. Uh, so make sure you check that out. Uh, Netscope uh, enhances cloud security capabilities. Beyond Trust uh, has some updates to their power broker agent uh, for Windows with respects to detecting lateral movement. Those links are in the show notes, wiki.securityweekly.com. Uh, with that, take a short break, come back, and do a little book review on The Phoenix Project, which was released uh, about five years ago. So stay tuned. <laughs> 